I'm Scott Hervey from Weintraub Tobin. And I'm Josh Escovito from Weintraub Tobin. Welcome to another installment of The Briefing by the IP Law Blog. Scott, I understand that as part of your practice and your work with production companies, you engage in some title clearance. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's correct, Josh. Do you know what that entails? Um, I think I have a pretty good idea, Scott, but maybe you could uh, provide a general overview for me. Sure. So basically, uh, as part of the work that I do for production companies, um, uh, a network will require when you're delivering a television show to deliver what's called clear title. And uh, your e &O insurance company uh, also requires a title report opinion, which is very similar to a trademark report opinion in order to bind your e &O insurance to cover any claims that may arise as a result of your use of the title of that television show or that motion picture. It's, it's a real similar process to how one might go about um, uh, clearing a trademark, right? We order a search report. We, well, we use Clarivate, but there's other services that you can use. Uh, and we get, a, we get a search report that um, covers a variety of different um, databases, um, looks at different uh, uses in the entertainment field of the title that you're searching. And then it also does, you know, full trademark search uh, and uh, internet search, which would include, you know, the federal trademark database, state trademark database, common law, trademark usage, internet, domain names, etc. Certain um, networks, broadcasters, platforms have uh, different um, scope of search requirements. Um, like there are some broadcasters that only require a United States um, United States full entertainment title search. There are others that require a international uh, title search. And there are some uh, that are very particular and have some very particular search requirements that require uh, some manual screening of uh, international uh, trademark databases. So it, it can be real complex and, and very interesting. Um, you know, but when we do a title search uh, in analyzing the report on whether the title's clear, we will look at the Second Circuit's test in the 1989 case of Rogers versus Grimaldi. And we've talked about that case a lot here. And, you know, um, the, Grimaldi, the Rogers test was adopted by the Ninth Circuit. Um, in the 2002 uh, Mattel versus MCA records case, which is the you know, infamous Barbie girl case. Um, and you know, I think it's important to understand the differences between what a, um, what a trademark search and what a title search looks at and why why we treat title searches a little bit different and why the courts treat title searches, um, or not title searches, but why the courts treat titles of creative works a little bit differently than they may treat the brand for a sneaker. Sure. And so now I just want to clarify, Scott, just, you know, because we're talking about legal issues here and often when we talk about clear title, we're talking about like a chain of title. But we're talking about title here. We're talking about titles of works, right? Right. Correct. Yeah. We're not talking about chain of title. That is a different, um, that is a different uh, thing. And, uh, but it also is an issue in the delivery of a entertainment property just similarly to real estate, you know, chain of title. That's usually when you get a title report from a title company for real estate and it lists chain of title, like who owned the property going way back to the first time that the house was built or the land was sold. And, um, you know, similarly in an entertainment property, a chain of title report will kind of go all the way back to the creation of the work, usually the author's agreement with somebody to write a script or the author's registration of a spec script with the WGA or something like that. But here we're talking about the title of a television series, you know, like Seinfeld or, um, you know, uh, Happy Days or what have you. Uh, and comparing that to like the a brand for a shoe like Nike or Reebok. 
Okay, so Scott, you mentioned that there's a distinction between trademark search reports and the analysis involved there and title search. And as you know, you and I have worked on several trademark search reports for brands, but as you know, I don't do as much work as you do in the entertainment space, uh, only litigation issues. So could you explain to me what the difference is in, in the analysis between a title search and a trademark search? So let's start at the at the the reason behind the analysis is different, right? Because um, you have to before you go to what the a different analysis is, you need to think about why we do this differently. And in Rogers and in the Ninth Circuit's adaptation of Rogers, Mattel, they talk about why we treat um, titles of creative works differently. Um, one, they implicate First Amendment rights of free speech. And that has to be balanced against the public interest in avoiding consumer confusion. And, and secondly, consumers are less likely to mistake the use of someone else's mark in an expressive work uh, as opposed to a sign of association, uh, authorship, or endorsement. So, um, so that's the reason why we treat them differently. You know, how they're treated differently is really the Rogers test, right? Um, you know, under the Rogers test, the title of an expressive work does not violate the Lanham Act unless the title has no artistic relevance to the underlying work whatsoever, or if it has some artistic relevance, um, it won't violate the Lanham Act unless the title explicitly misleads as to the source or content of the work. Right, and so that test has been adopted, as you mentioned, in the Ninth Circuit, um, and it originates out of the Second Circuit. And if I recall correctly, it's also been adopted by the Fifth and Sixth Circuits. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, that's correct, Josh. Let's talk a little bit about the first factor, the artistic relevance factor. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's interesting uh, because the cases um, in the Ninth Circuit that have analyzed Rogers uh, including the most recent case um, involving um, 20th Century Fox over the uh, television show Empire, they basically say that you know the artistic relevance um, it doesn't need to be that great, right? The, the the language has been it has to be less than zero, um, which is pretty low uh, in, in order to take the analysis out of the regular old. Lanham Act likelihood of confusion analysis and, and bring it into this this test that is clearly more favorable to creative content. Right. Yeah, I, I actually remember the discussion of this first factor in the uh, the Jack Daniels dog squeaky the squeaky dog toy case. And, uh, you know, I think the, the court there said something like it doesn't need to reach the level of Anna Karenina. And uh, I think it also mentioned something about a, a Hallmark card featuring the honey badger. And I think it yeah. said something like honey yeah, badger I, don't care or something like that. And that was sufficient. Yeah, that's the um, that's the Gordon v. Drape creative case uh, where uh, Gordon, you know, he's the guy that created the cultural phenomenon known as the honey badger, right? He's a guy who had those. <laughs> YouTube videos that had you know, pictures of the honey badger doing all kinds of stuff. And he came up with the statement, you know, honey badger don't care and honey badger this and honey badger that. Uh, and you know, guy, guy was smart enough to file, um, file some trademark registrations covering honey badger don't care and a couple of other terms related to honey badger. And, uh, you know, he filed them for a wide variety of goods and services, including greeting cards. And Drape Creative, um, Drape Creative produced a greeting card and they used a very, they using, using variations of Honey Badger don't care. And Gordon sued them. And the Ninth Circuit, like the Honey Badger, kind of didn't care, right? Applying Rogers. The court found that the artistic relevance of um, Drape, the card company, Drake's use of honey badger don't care was above zero. So it passed the first part of the Rogers test, right? The artistic relevance. The court sent it back, the Ninth Circuit sent it back to the district court in order to determine whether Drake's use was explicitly misleading. But like this shows you how 
far in favor of the creative work um, Rogers tends to be, uh, which is interesting because it's a really great lead-in to, uh, to the case that I wanted to talk about, which was this, this case out of Colorado, which falls within the Tenth Circuit, that really kind of took a fresh look at uh, Rogers and its progeny and decided that it wasn't all that in a bag of chips. And they wanted to come up with their own analysis. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we'll have an interesting discussion about, about the test that they want to apply. Because, you know, if you look at Rogers, maybe this court is not so off base. So, you know, this is, um, this is the case of uh, Stouffer versus National Geographic. And um, I'll give you the facts. In the 80s and 90s, Marty Stouffer Productions produced a nature documentary series titled Wild America. And it was regularly televised on PBS. And episodes of this are still available and aired on television. And they can be purchased on DVD. And they're accessible through major streaming services. I bet you could find it on like Pluto right now, you know? Um, anyways, Nat, Nat Geo offers uh, nature-oriented documentary programming on its Nat Geo TV uh, and Nat Geo Wild stations. Uh, National Geographic had explored with Stouffer the possibility of licensing or purchasing his library, but no deal was reached. In 2010, um, Nat Geo requested the ability to use the title Wild Americas or Wildest Americas for a natural history mini-series, and um, Stouffer declined. Uh, Stouffer thought that those titles were too close to Stouffer's registered Wild America trademark. In 2012, National Geographic aired the series anyways, with the title Untamed Americas in the US and the title Wild America Abroad. Uh, National Geographic subsequently re released na nature-themed programs in the U.S. under the titles America the Wild, Surviving Wild America, and America's Wild Frontier. So I take it Stouffer sued. And since National Geographic is a subsidiary of 20th Century Fox, and given 20th's success in the Empire case, I'm certain 20th filed a motion to dismiss under the Rogers test. Right, they did. Uh, but this was a um, this was a case of, of first impression in Colorado and under the Tenth Circuit. The the Rogers test has been adopted by it was well it was created by the Second Circuit and adopted by the Ninth Circuit as well as the Fifth and the Sixth Circuit. The Tenth Circuit hasn't hadn't really dealt with a case like this before, um, and so the you know the the, the court agreed with the principles in, in analyzing um, uh, National Geographic's motion to dismiss. Uh, the court agreed with the pinnings underlying the Rogers test that the Lanham Act needs limiting construction to protect the First Amendment and First Amendment speech, and that um, First Amendment-based limiting construction on the Lanham Act should occur, and, and the, a court should apply this test prior to trial. The court also asked whether the Rogers test is the right test. And as I previously said, um, they kind of said, not really. Uh, we're not really big fans. Um, they said basically that the Rogers test is too limiting. And they also found that it is it, it might be too uh, favorable to um, well, not too favorable to First Amendment speech, but it's it's created in a way that would allow a, an individual to basically hide behind Rogers if a work is minimally protected by the First Amendment. So trying to balance what they saw as an inequity, um, the court came up with its own six non-exclusive factors to look at rather than the two questions posed by Rogers. And those factors are as follows. 
Uh, do the senior and junior users use the same mark to identify the same kind or similar kinds of goods or services? Uh, to what extent has the junior user added his or own expressive content to the work beyond the mark itself? Does the timing of the junior user's use in any way suggest a motive to capitalize on popularity of the senior user's mark? Interesting whether they were thinking of the honey badger case when they came up with that factor, right? In what way is the mark artistically relevant to the underlying work, service, or product? Has the junior user made any statement to the public or engaged in any conduct known to the public that suggests a non-artistic motive? Uh, this would include explicitly misleading statements, but they're not confined to that definition. And lastly, has the junior user made any statements in private or engaged in any conduct in private that suggests a non-artistic motive? The point of these factors is to probe the question, did the alleged infringer have a genuine artistic motive for using the mark? How is that fundamentally different from the first prong of the Rogers test? Does the title have artistic relevance to the work? It's one way to look at it is, you know, it's an examination of the motive intent of the alleged infringer in adopting the mark, right? Um, I mean, when you think about it, artistic relevance under Rogers is determined by evidence introduced by the parties. Artistic motive under Stouffer is determined the same way. Um, so it, 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 may not, it may not seem like um, much of a difference. And, and frankly, I had a little bit of trouble discerning, um, discerning the difference as well. Um, but I think the difference, or at least the court explained that the difference seem to really focus on the, the fact that in the Rogers test, the artistic relevance really just needs to be minimal, right? It needs to be above zero. And like the, I think the, the court, well, I don't think in reading the opinion, it's clear to me that the court found that not to be palatable. Basically, the, the this district court said, if you take Rogers and you add the Empire case to that, uh, which which looked at the definition of um, you know ex explicitly misleading statements and said like, we mean those words mean what they say. Explicitly misleading means an overt, explicit misleading statement, and then add Gordon to that, and the district court said this means trademarks registered for arguably artistic products and services are not worth the paper that the trademark registration is printed on. As long as the junior user makes no overt claim to associate with the senior user, the junior user can market precisely the same artistic product or services under the same mark. And, and they raise, you know, they raise an interesting question. Why why is it that artistic relevance need only be zero? When you think about it, like how much weight, it, the, the Rogers test is supposed to be a balancing of First Amendment and trademark rights, correct? Correct. But if you have the artistic relevance being at zero or, you know, point zero point zero 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 one, right, which is more than zero, <laughs> Like, how is that a balancing test? It's it, it's not. It, I mean, it, it comes across as more of a threshold. Like as soon as you cross this threshold, you've you've satisfied the test and you're you're entitled to protection. And right, I, I think I mean, that's my I think that's my biggest issue with the Rogers test is it is too restrictive. I mean, once you get past the uh, minimal artistic relevance factor, then you're just dealing with this explicitly misleading aspect. And as you said, the court in the Empire case said that it means what it says. And so that doesn't really take into consideration any other motivations, which it seems like the 10th Circuit was trying, or not the 10th Circuit, but the district court in Colorado, and then subsequently the 10th Circuit uh, were trying to account for. Yeah, I mean, they, they, the opinion had a very interesting statement. It said, you know, it ultimately comes down to how much solicitude one believes the First Amendment interest should receive in this context. 
They said, we believe the First Amendment places the thumb on the scale of expressive use, but they believe the Ninth Circuit, the Second Circuit, and those folks follow, those other circuits following Rogers, they believe that the First Amendment places a fist on the scale of expressive <laughs> use, right? And they're kind of, they're kind of not wrong. They're, they're kind of not wrong. Um, Right. If you if you only have to pass this threshold and show minimal artistic relevance, as in the Gordon case, the Honey Badger case, um, it's not it's not much, very much of a balancing test. And, right. and they're right. It does open it up to misuse. I mean, they basically said that you know any. Um, anyone that's really willing to take on the risk of defending a trademark claim, if they are minimally artistic in their use of the mark, and as long as they're willing to spend the money, uh, they can win, a, they can defeat a trademark claim based on the Rogers test. And that doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't, but you know, when dealing with the Rogers test, it does seem like it's, you know, depending on where your morals and ethics are, it seems like you could overcome that test pretty easily or, or use that test to your advantage, I should say. Well, I think, you know, and part of the, what this Colorado court was talking about is they basically said that the, the honey badger court like twisted itself in, in, a, in a knot to try to avoid um, what they perceive to be a bad decision, right? I, I think that the Colorado court believes that the Ninth Circuit, looking at the Honey Badger case, did not believe the, the card company to be a good actor. And they, but they, like, you know, greeting cards are creative works. They're expressive works, and obviously their creativity is above zero. The use of any, any word in a greeting card uh, the creativity and the choice of that word is above zero. Um, probably the only thing that's not creative in a greeting card uh, might be the, I don't know, the price stamp on the back of the greeting card. But then again, one could probably argue that usually that's embossed in some fancy color. So maybe that's a, the creativity there is even above zero. So, you know, it's not a very high burden. And, and the Colorado court said that the, the honey badger court like, twisted itself to try to get it back to the the jury, the district court, to try to find a way to address this bad actor. I don't know what happened after the Ninth Circuit, so I don't know whether it was settled or whether the district court found there to be, you know, some overt act um, violating the second prong of the Rogers test. Um, but you know, this this test that offered up by uh, this Colorado court and the 10th Circuit might be interesting. And I thought we could kind of run through the factors um, and look at how it all laid out. So, you know, the first, the first prong in the analysis was, do the senior and junior users use the same mark to identify the same kind or similar kinds of goods or services? So here it's, yes, we're both talking about television programming. Right. You know, nature documentaries. So, um, so that one's not so good for National Geographic, right? Yeah. To what and the second factor, to what extent has the junior user added his or her own expressive content to the work beyond the mark itself? Well, here, Stouffer acknowledges that the series had some degree of original expressive content added by National Geographic, given that National Geographic created an entirely new program. Uh, but that such original content is fundamentally undermined by National Geographic's wholesale use of Wild America's template in doing so. Uh, by the Wild America template, Stouffer refers to the structure of many accused series episodes, namely introducing an animal, following said animal, recording footage of the animal in conflict, and providing information about the animal and the uncanny similarity between each show's host, with Casey Anderson adopting an appearance of persona that closely resembles the distinctive look and style of Marty Stouffer. Yeah, I mean, to that, it's interesting. You know, the court found that the two hosts 
like the court found some issues with Stouffer's position here because the two hosts don't look anything alike. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, and, and the court said, look, at this at this at the pleading stage, um, Stouffer's allegations deserve some weight. But, you know, Stouffer's allegations in this regard, they said, are rather generic, except for nature documentaries that are not about animals at all. It's simply hard to imagine a nature documentary that does not introduce an animal, follow an animal around, show the animal in conflict and provide information about the animal. You know, his um, they said Stouffer's failure to plead anything more specific must factor into the court's overall analysis below. The next factor is, you know, does the timing of the junior user's use in any way suggest a motive to capitalize on popularity, on the popularity of the senior user's mark? Now, the Wild America series uh, ran on PBS and it ended in 1996. Um, the kind of most recent uh, exploitation of Stouffer's Wild America branded program was one or more direct-to-video specials, which were advertised, marketed, and sold in the late 90s and early 2000s. There really, Stouffer hadn't, didn't introduce any evidence showing um, further use of marketing uh, more into the two, uh, year 2000s and beyond. And, and although Wild America episodes remain in syndication and can be bought or downloaded, Stouffer at this, he didn't offer any statistical information on viewership or sales or downloads and basically the court said he just failed to establish uh he failed to establish that his mark or his product was popular at the time that national geographic launched their show and and, and thus failed to establish a motive to capitalize on the popularity of Stouffer's uh, program. On to the fourth factor. In what way is the mark artistically related to the underlying work, service, or product? Stouffer uses the Wild America mark and National Geographic uses its titles for the same purpose, to inform the viewer about what he or she should expect to see during the program. And now for the fifth factor. Has the junior user made any statements to the public or engaged in any conduct known to the public that suggests a non-artistic motive? Here the court agreed with Stouffer that Nat Geo's use of Wild America as the name for its international version of the series is relevant to this consideration, even if not actionable itself. In other words, could it su suggest a desire of National Geographic to use Stouffer's mark for its trademark value? Or was it just a really good title for a show? And on to the next factor. Has the junior user made any statement in private or engaged in any conduct in private that suggests a non-artistic motive? Uh, here, National Geographic had contacted Stouffer to ask for permission to title its upcoming series, uh, which, as we know, became Untamed Americas as either Wild Americas or Wildest Americas. This could suggest a desire to use the mark or something close to it for its trademark value. Uh, on the other hand, it could suggest a mere desire to avoid unnecessary conflict. And then the court, after running through all that, synthesized all of this. And it, it, the synthesis is interesting. The court said the choice of a title for a creative expression is an expressive choice unto itself, including the choice of a descriptive title. Each of National Geographic's programs substantially focuses on America's wildlands. And, and while the English language is really expansive, uh, I mean, the last time I picked up a dictionary is pretty heavy, uh, the range of words to describe a program that focuses on the American wildlands is pretty limited, right? Like it's, it's how do you find any synonyms for America and for wildlands? I mean, it's, it's hard, it's really challenging. If trademark words themselves and their synonyms are off limits, then artistic choices regarding a title it becomes significantly constrained. Um, you know, this case, the court said this case might have been different 
if Stouffer's Wild America series had been about you know, American teens engaging in risky behavior and Nat Geographic's America the Wild covered the same or similar topic. But, you know, that's because a looser relationship between the title and the subject matter may give an inference to the fact that Nat Geo primarily chose a title for its um, popularity as opposed to just describing what they're going to, what someone will watch when they turn on that show. Um, the, the, in this case, it's interesting, even though, you know, the court went through all of this different analysis, um, then, then engaging in what probably would have been a much quicker analysis under the Rogers test, we, we really end up in the same place. Um, you know, the court ended up dismissing Rogers' case with prejudice. Um, the, the court found that the, uh, even in viewing Stouffer's allegations in a light most favorable to him, the objective facts established that Nat Geographic's titles for their shows deserved First Amendment protection even if Stouffer could prove likelihood of confusion. The same result they would have gotten under Rogers for sure, but I think a little bit more analysis on the creative weight and, and how, you know, how the title, um, how the title is relevant. It's interesting, right? The, the court, if you remember what the, the court in Empire, and how they looked at artistic relevance. Like they examined, well, this is a show about a, a record company in New York. <laughs> so, you know, like, of course we're gonna talk about, it's gonna be, you know, empire. And it's also a case about a dynasty, right? So what, do you, what are dynasties? They're empires. You could use dynasty or you could use empire, but it's in New York. So you're not going to call it dynasty. Maybe if it was in Texas, they would have called it dynasty. I don't know, right? Um, you know, the, the court in the Empire case engaged in the same kind of analysis that you see here under the Rogers test. So, uh, you know, one has to question really, was all this necessary? Did the Honey Badger court just get it wrong? Um, should the Honey Badger court maybe have found no artistic relevance? Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know who's right or who's wrong here. I think it's just very interesting that now we've got a different test uh, in the Tenth Circuit, possibly, with different factors that are going to acquire a different analysis uh, when doing a title opinion. Yeah, Scott, and I think this case is really interesting because the, the court had to anal had to deal with a very complicated analysis and wrestle with some significant issues. You know, do we want courts making determinations as to what constitutes art? I think that most artists would say no, not even close. And so it's a tough issue to decide, like, what? how do you create a litmus test that decides on whether something is or is not artistic? So I thought it was very interesting the way the court dealt with this issue and came up with these other factors to do what it could to try to get around that issue and, and at least probe the issue further. Uh, what'll be interesting to see is if this gets appealed to the 10th Circuit, um, and if it does, if the 10th Circuit upholds this test, uh, if it does, then we could finally have a circuit split, which would be at odds with the 2nd, 9th, 5th, and 6th circuits, which uh, all follow Grimaldi. Um, so maybe the Supreme Court would then have an appetite for uh, putting it into the dispute. Right. It's interesting to wonder as well whether this court would have followed Rogers had there not been the honey badger decision, right? I mean, they seemed just perplexed, not perplexed, but they seemed troubled by that case. Because in the end, this, this court, the Colorado court, came to the same conclusion that one would come to in applying the Rogers test, um, clearly. 
Uh, but I think they just seem troubled by the Gordon case, the Honey Badger case. And they wanted to try to find a way to address, uh, like, to, to address that, to address the uh, more of a balancing of the First Amendment and um, trademark rights. And I, I think they just found that that wasn't done in the Honey Badger case, and they were looking for a, a, a better way to balance those interests. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that they're right. They may be right. It's certainly interesting, um, you know, the, the balancing of the First Amendment, having it be a factor as opposed to, uh, as opposed to being like a cudgel, right? <laughs> so, because um, that's what it is, in, at least in, 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 um, in their analysis, they think the First Amendment is a cudgel. Once you, once you have that cudgel and beat the defendant over the head with it, or the plaintiff over the head with it in your motion that is missed, you're out, um, as long as the court finds that artistic relevance. Right, Scott, it will be interesting to see how some of the other circuit courts deal with this. For example, I'd like to see how the 4th and the 11th circuits, which include Florida and South Carolina, would come out on these issues. As you and I both know, that there's quite a bit of video game production coming out of both of those states. So right. that gives rise to the potential for some creative work litigation. Right. You know, you see a lot of television uh, coming out of Florida as well. So, And, you know, who knows? Maybe the 5th and 6th might take another look at... Uh, their adoption of Rogers. They, I mean, I don't know the case law in those uh, circuits, but they might not be as entrenched as the Ninth Circuit is in its following of Rogers. So it'll be really interesting to see. Um, you know, it's really interesting when you start to see other circuits start to pick apart tests that have been used by other circuits. Um, and, and it's, you know, it creates a little bit of work for me, more work for me when I'm clearing a title, but it's you know it's always interesting right we live uh we live in interesting times that's definitely true <laughs> all right thanks josh thank you scott thanks for watching i hope you enjoyed this installment of the briefing by the ip law blog please subscribe to our youtube channel and visit our website www.theiplawblog.com thanks